ಕಥಾಮೃತ ತತ್ತೀವನ ಕವಿರೀರಿತ ಕಲ್ಮಶಾಪಹ ಶ್ರವಣ ಮಂಗಲ ಶ್ರೀಮದಾತ ಭುವಿ ಗ್ರಹಂತಿ so the master and vijay goswami so sri ramakrishna's conversation with vijay goswami the worldly minded forget their lessons sri ramakrishna the bound creatures entangled in worldliness will not come to their senses at all they suffer so much misery and agony they face so many dangers and yet they will not wake up the camel loves to eat thorny bushes the more it eats the thorns the more the blood the more the blood gushes from its mouth still it must eat thorny plants and will never give them up so here sri ramakrishna what is indicating has been very nicely exemplified in one of the episode of the life of swami sharadananda when shavi swaradananda was in the west uh, after the very first uh, discourse which he had to give being insisted by swami vivekananda so after that the question and answer session that also swami ji insisted that swami sharadananda conduct it and it was the first time he is encountering some audience and in the question and answer session a very nice question came the question can prove to be quite challenging that the the one who questioned he asked that what is life and we find that swami sharadananda in one line is giving an answer it's a wonderful answer see what is life we will be bewildered we are living it but to answer, what to answer that what is life and swami sharadananda an illumined soul in one light is giving a very very apt answer which speaks of his real reflection on life what he is saying that life is nothing but a series of experiences what a wonderful answer it's a series of experiences going on one after other and then the next question was that what is the aim of life yes i do understand that it is a series of experiences and again in one line his reply was wonderful to learn from those experiences see he is not speaking of god he is not speaking of any faith the beliefs pertaining to any denomination nothing it's a very broad answer in whatever stage of life we may be whatever may be our faith whatever may be our belief can anyone deny the fact that the aim of life is to learn from the experiences and not to do the mistakes which we have done and have repented for it that speaks of our wisdom and that's the thing sri ramakrishna is indicating we all are lacking that our memory is not that strong as we think the camel loves to eat thorny bushes the more it eats the thorns the more the blood gushes from its mouth still it must eat thorny plants and will never give them up it speaks of we never learn the lessons we forget very easily what we have gone through i still remember in the school days i used to have school exhibitions and in one of those exhibitions uh, there was a wonderful display that an earthworm was kept in a T shaped cabinet it's transparent cabinet cabinet made of glass it was a T shaped 
So the T has three legs. In one of the legs, the earthworm was kept, and in another leg, there was some uh, moist grass, the soil and the moist grass, and there was something to feed on for the earthworm. But as it was moist there and it was connected with some very low voltage where the earthworm in its attempt to go for the food will get the shock and it will be repelled. It won't die but it will get the shock. And there is a third leg which is empty. And it was found that repeatedly the earthworm whenever it comes to the junction it will go to the that moist soil where the food is there, it will get that mild shock and return, but it never goes to any other leg. It will again and again repeat the same procedure. The experiment was just to show that they, this earthworm has a very poor memory. But the same thing actually applies to us as a human being. Do we have a very strong memory? No. Our life doesn't show that that we go through the so many harsh experiences of life and which all comes because of attachment to our life, tremendous attachment. And we never learn that to lead a detached life is the only way that we can avoid suffering that we never learn. We go with that. I still remember one of our presidents, Swami Bhuteshananda. One day one devotee came, one lady, and she was crying, weeping, and was relating all the experiences, all the harsh experiences she has went through in her life. And she was asking, is there any remedy? And Bhutishanji was a very, very wise person, and he had a very presence of mind. The answers were very, one is to be very wonderful, apt answers, short answers. So he silently, very calmly told, the solution is very easy, it's very easy. And the lady thought that after all the Maharaj, an illumined soul, he is speaking most probably there is some solution which is going to give me. And he asked, what's the solution? And he told me detached. So that's the, see, very easy. That reduce, that just don't be so much attached to life. Don't expect so much. Be a bit detached. You'll find the suffering. And she was totally, uh, what you will say, discouraged. She thought that so she's going to get some very easy remedy. And the thing which was asked is detachment. So our life shows that our attachment to the life is the only cause of our suffering because we never learn. That's the basic thing even Buddha, after his spiritual illumination, have understood. That what is life? Dukkha. What is the cause? Tanha. The first Aryan truth, the first noble truth is that there is suffering and the second is the cause of suffering. What is that? Attachment, clinging, tanha. So this is a very basic thing if we can understand the life can be something very very fulfilling but we never understand. The same mistakes we with a lot of expectations, we get harsh experiences but still we go on with that clinging with all the expectations and that's what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating. The bound creatures entangled in worldliness will not come to their senses at all. They suffer so much misery and agony. They face so many dangers and yet they will not wake up. The camel loves to eat thorny bushes. The more it eats the thorns, the more the blood gushes from its mouth. Still, it must eat thorny plants and will never give them up. The man of worldly nature suffers so much sorrow and afflictions, but he forgets it all in a few days and begins his old life over again. Suppose a man has lost his wife or she has turned unfaithful, lo, he marries again, or take the instance of a mother. Her son dies and she suffers bitter grief, but after a few days she forgets all about it. The mother, so overwhelmed with sorrow a few days before, now attends to her toilet and puts on her jewelry. A father becomes bankrupt through the marriage of his daughters. 
yet he goes on having children year after year. People are ruined by litigation, yet they go to court all the same. There are men who cannot feed the children they have, who cannot clothe them or provide decent shelter for them, yet they have more children every year. So this is the wonderful thing that we never learn from the experience again and again. Sri Ramakrishna is indicating through these various examples. So if you go through the life of Sri Ramakrishna, you'll find that there's a wonderful definition of purity, that purity is not innocence. It is the maturity which we gather, which we gain through the experiences of life. If you become mature through the experiences of life, that speaks of pure. It is not the innocence. The child is not pure. The child is innocent. But all the subliminal impressions which are yet to find expression, which are dormant in the mind, the moment it starts growing, it becomes an adult, you'll find that the so-called innocent child, suddenly the behavior pattern has changed because all the things were hidden. Sri Ramakrishna used to we we'll used to give an example that the parrot seems that whatever seeds it has eaten, that it has gone to the stomach. But no, it's all there in its throat. You just go and try to press it, you will find it's all there. So similarly, the desires and everything, we think we have been fulfilled, but nothing has fulfilled. It is still there to again bounce back. They're all there hidden in the subconscious mind as a samskara. And again they come back. So purity is not just mere innocence. When with the age, with the favorable circumstances, you will find that the, all the things which I have never thought of that person has started behaving in a totally different way. The real purity is maturity through experience. In Mahabharata there are stories, wonderful stories, that the son of a rishi from the childhood was in the forest, never uh, went uh, to intermingle with the society. So the child was apparently pure. Now, a king's daughter had to be married and the condition was uh, that he has to be married to a, very, a soul who has never been in any way tarnished by the worldly way of life. Now, how to get such a person? And the king heard of this Rishi's son and now the king makes up his mind to give his daughter to that Rishi's son in marriage. Now how is it possible? Now in the daytime the Rishi is to go out from his hermitage deep into the forest for doing his spiritual practices and this small, uh, not small, he has already reached his puberty but he is apparently very pure because he has not been tarnished in any way by the worldly attachment. He used to just roam about near the hermitage. We will just gather some fruits and just roam about here and there. And the king, when he knew that he is there unattended, just roaming about alone, they planned a very nice thing. What? That all the, this, the princess along with her attendants, who are all females, they dressed as boys. And they disguised themselves as boys and went to the forest in the absence of their father they started intermingling with this son of the rishi and thinking them just to be the boys he was mixing with them and suddenly he started feeling a tremendous attachment he never knew what it is and that's how that gradual that gradual attachment at last impelled that boy to at last get uh, entangled in the worldly way of life. The king somehow managed to ensnare the son of the Rishi. What it speaks of? That it is not mere innocence that is purity. That the, when the circumstances changes, your sub samskaras, they will spring back. What it is? It is maturity through the past experiences which you have gone through. In our scriptures they say very nicely, what they say, that what's the difference between an ordinary person and a spiritual person? It's just the sensitivity. An ordinary person is like a, 
a person uh, on whose skin some sand particle has fallen and most probably he doesn't notice it and the same sand particle if it falls on the eyes eyeball immediately he will find that irritation so what they're saying that the this real purity is that sensitivity just like that eyeball the same sand particle which in no way irritates me when it falls on my skin starts irritating me intensely if it falls on my eyeball so this sensitivity what it speaks as has been spoken of in the bible not as has been spoken it's not in the bible it's in an english as a proverb that the price of purity is vigilance that more through the experiences of life you become very vigilant and at the very uh, what is it, the root of the cause of any attachment he knows how to detach sometimes our uh, lack of uh, this maturity makes us take things very lightly and we get involved thinking they are all innocent pleasures of life and as sri ramakrishna used to say that the path to downfall is very gradual it's very slow it doesn't allow us to realize that we are going down sri ramakrishna used to give the example of the fort william in calcutta it was built in the british time and it's a, a place to just uh, what you say it's a place to visit it's a very nice place with beautiful gardens and everything so people go just to go around that place but from the road if you have to go to the fort william it's a very gradual slope it is such so gradual you never realize that you are going down the slope but when you have reached fort william and you look back then you realize that what you have what a great height you have actually came down sri ramakrishna is saying this in the gospel of sri ram in the in the gospel this example is there in the gospel what is indicating that the in in bengal it is called kolambara rasta it's a very gradual slope the path to downfall we get gradually entangled not knowing that our fall is not sudden but it is gradually taking me entangling me more and more to the worldly ways of life the things which we thought innocent were not that innocent there's a nice example in the life of sri ramakrishna that what it means that purity is maturity through experiences that sri ramakrishna when he was in dakshineshwar he was doing his spiritual it was it was a period of his spiritual sadhana he was going through intense spiritual practices but for four months during the rainy season he used to come back to kamarpukur his uh, birthplace is this parental house and he used to stay for that four months in kamarpukur and now he was already married by that time holy mother she was still young so she st- was staying with her parents in jairambati and it's just 3 4 kilometers distance not much so when sri ramakrishna used to come to kamarpukur the holy mother who was just uh, it was in her teens not even in her teens she was just a young girl she used to come and stay with ramakrishna for those few months and she was a very shy girl and she used to do the household work naturally the village in the village that's that uh, that's the tradition the village girls will be doing all the household work now she one day was uh, brooming the courtier and sri ramakrishna was sitting on one of the corners of the courtier he was just relaxing and he was as is was his nature always in a joyous mood and he had his own way of instructing that holy was seeing holy mother such a young girl he never was think of speaking of any high philosophy in very simple words he was instructing something which speaks of renunciation what he was saying that as after all she is now growing she is a young girl and she is the wife of ramakrishna and she has the right to demand for a child it's very natural in a marriage that's the thing for that the marriage is but sri ramakrishna's life was meant to be something different 
It had a different purpose. Now Sri Ramakrishna wanted to instruct Holy Mother in those lines of detachment. And what he was saying was something interesting. In a very light manner, he was saying that what's the use of having child? Uh, Holy Mother with a long well was just brooming the courtyard and Sri Ramakrishna uh, just in a very casual way, jokingly was saying, what's the, what's the use of having the children? That you can just remain as you are. If you have children, the first child you have and the day of the rice giving ceremony, after six months when the child is born, that on the day of the rice giving ceremony you are very joyous, you adorn yourself with all the ornaments, wear a very expensive sari, and you, are, you have invited you know, all the villagers, you are in a mood of making merriment, a lot of fun and merriment, and then suddenly you find the child is not well, he is getting a bit sick, and immediately you take the child to the village doctor, and he's diagnosed with most probably cholera. And in a few days, in those days, there were no treatment. In a few days, he dies. You all throw, you open up your ornament, just get rid of that costly sari. You just well and weep uh, because of that loss of your children. And then again, after most probably one or year or two, another child is born. And this time, most probably dies because of malaria. And now Ramakrishna was repeating again and again. That a child is born, he dies because of cholera, dies because of malaria, dies again because of smallpox. So what's the use of having children? And now this small girl, because uh, even you know there are so many others to always suggest so many things. So she has heard that the, after all your husband is otherworldly. Apparently he's mad. Most probably you won't have children. And what for the marriage is? So already those words she was hearing. So now hearing from Ramakrishna what's the use for having children naturally. She thought that after all that's to become mother, what's the harm in it? And then she very mildly retorted back after when Sri Ramakrishna was again and again saying that the children, once the children is born and they are dying, very mildly she retorted, will all of them die? Just that much only. And Sri Ramakrishna who was just joking he became very serious. He jumped up from his seat and he told her what he said was something which made Holy Mother feel highly embarrassed and she also ran away hearing that. What he told? Oh, it seems I have trampled over the on the tail of a, over the tail of a, a deadly venomous snake. Uh, so saying that, Sri Ramakrishna jumped up and Holy Mother ran away. So, yeah. When he got the trace of the desire as if he's there in the mind, maybe it's not her uh, desire. After hearing from others, that expectation has grown that let me also have a child. But Ramakrishna's life purpose was already decided. He was leading a life, an exemplary life for the peoples, for the generations to follow. So he was very aware of it. And now seeing that, was he hearing that one sentence, immediately jumped up. That speaks of, beauty speaks of vigilance. That I have, Ramakrishna must probably have not gone through the experiences. He's, we say he's an avatar. But to show the world that what purity means, that purity is vigilance, that from the experiences of life, unless we learn and become that sensitive, that even at the very, what you say that the indication of little involvement in worldly way can, I, can actually at last drag me uh, to the depths of misery and agony can make him very very sensitive and vigilant and he immediately knows where to retreat where from where to retreat and comes back unless we develop that faculty then our condition is just what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. That one after after other, we go through the experiences of life, but we forget. Again, we go on to getting the same thing without any remedy as per our suffering is concerned. Sometimes it appears that the mother nature 
has actually uh, is uh, what you say has uh, is has planned a eternal conspiracy with us is going on the uh, what you say that when anyone wants to become a monk in our order they say that generally the parents of course they will start crying weeping wailing a great opposition forgetting that for generations that after all marriage the married life has not given something uh, what you say fulfillment there were so many that we know that we all go through that process and then we find that in that type in that life it is not that it is going to give you ultimate fulfillment but still that we don't find fulfillment from my own life but i want others to repeat the same life and that seems as if the eternal conspiracy of nature so from a man who has spiritually evolved so that's the first lesson he has to learn that learn from the experiences of life and not to go on that bandwagon where all are traveling just on the same way it's just like the way of the ship the leadership there are 10 this is this is a joke that uh, the 10 ship were just going uh, was walking on a very narrow dam uh, it was a question of a maths teacher that there are there's a grass field there's a paddy field on both the sides and the embankment very a narrow embankment on that the 10 ships are walking and the one ship the one who is the leading the one who is in the front it somehow slips on the paddy field so how many ships are there on the embankment that narrow embankment so of course the question answer should be 9 that he was just teaching them the simple mathematics of subtraction and when he asked one of the student what is that how many ships are there the reply they immediately told not a single it is told how well, well sir i don't know mathematics but i am the son of a farmer and i always deal with this ships and i am i go and tend them i take them i know their nature if one goes down all will go down so that's what we do we just follow the wind wagon that that we make the so called the blind as our uh, leader it is a blind leading the blind as in the upanishad it has been spoken of andhe naiva niyamana yathanda just the blind leading the blind we think that we are very intelligent but we are all committing the same mistake with our intelligence is in the worldly way but where the very common sensical intelligence which is required to understand the way of life that somehow we never understand and that's what sri ramakrishna is indicating again the worldly man is like a snake trying to swallow a mole the snake can neither swallow the mole nor give it up the bound soul may have realized that there is no substance to the world that the world is like a hawk plum only stone and skin but still he cannot give it up and turn his mind to god it has no substance he may have understood it intellectually but in no way that helps him to get read there is no overhauling of his personality there is no behavioral change the same behavioral pattern continues though he may have understood it but still he cannot change it is just like a drug addict he is aware of the ill effects of the addiction but he cannot give it up the samskaras are very difficult to get read off the swami yatishwaranand used to say that uh that one person uh, was uh in, in a child care center the t the one who is supposed to look after the children was somehow uh not able to make the children quiet so so the, super, the supervisor came and told why don't you use your will power and this lady who was looking after the child told i do use my will power but the children's won't power is stronger than my will power that's the problem that i use my will power but their won't power is stronger than my <coughs> will power and that happens with our mind the words in the words of jesus in the bible the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak the spirit is willing 
but the flesh is weak. So they understand, but they cannot do anything uh, because they find that the samskaras just overwhelm them. Their willpower is if no evil. As has been spoken of by Sri Ramakrishna in the gospel in some other context, that tablar bol mukhe bola shahoj hate ana kothin. That when you are playing the percussion, the tabla, when you are learning, the teacher comes and he speaks out the rhythm and he asks you to memorize it and spell it out. It takes hardly five minutes. Very easily you can learn it from the teacher and you can spell it out, the tabla's rhythm. And now the teacher says, play it. It will take months. So to play the tabla is not that easy. You can immediately in five minutes you can say its rhythm but to bring it in your hand it will take months and that's with the so-called our life the do's and don'ts we all understand but somehow we find it doesn't in any way reflect in our behavioral pattern now why it happens now understanding is not enough this is a very interesting thing unless it overhauls our personality by the upsurge of a befitting emotion some other befitting emotion there should be an upsurge just understanding is not enough sri ramakrishna the master of examples in some other context in this gospel he is giving a wonderful example what he's saying can a person indulge in sunset pleasures the day his or her child has died impossible however attached he may be the day the child has died he's so overwhelmed with that grief can he indulge in any sort of sense of pleasure that day so what has happened it's not mere understanding you should have a very strong emotions to counteract all these emotions related to your world of senses so that speaks of the love of god that's what he's saying he still out he still cannot give it up and turn his mind to God that he doesn't have that tremendous love for the divine which alone can help him to get rid of all the desires so it is not just the understanding but that counteractive emotion which is very important that this emotion should overwhelm should be so much that it overwhelms all other as Sri Ramakrishna used to give a very nice example that a ship in the ocean was just passing by the side of a mountain which was made of magnet magnetic it was a magnetic magnetic mountain and the moment it was passing suddenly the ship shattered it fell uh, into pieces why because this all its parts were bolted with the iron screws iron bolts that when it was passing by the side of that magnet uh, ma mountain, magnetic mountain, the bolts were all pulled out because of the strong pull of the magnet and the entire ship just simply disintegrated. So what he is actually saying that God is like that magnet, is a strong magnet. All our attachment, the desires are like the bolts which has in kept us in this worldly form to get rid to transmigrate uh, to just transcend this that strong love that magnet has to be there I have to be in association with that that strong overwhelming emotion has to be there so that is one thing and another thing is to give up give up and turn the mind to God and why we cannot give up so that also you will find in the life of Sri Ramakrishna so these are the very important things that we should have we have to develop an overwhelming emotion love for god that alone can help us to get rid of our desires and another thing is important that sometimes we think i am taking resolution but i fail we forget that our addictions doesn't only involve our mind our mind our body our senses everything is involved but when i'm taking a resolution it just the my mind is involved how can you interact uh, with something which is a synergy all our desires you know very well we all know very well it not only involves our mind our body 
our senses, everything just is, becomes a synergistic whole. And it is a tremendous force. And with my mind, I'm taking a resolution to counter it. It's not possible. So when we take a resolution, that resolution also has to integrate the body. You have to do something physically that I shouldn't be in its presence. I have to go out, away from it. Not only that, Sri Ramakrishna, when he renounced that, uh, what do you say? The wealth from his mind that I, I if I, as a, that I find that this world, after all, the attachment is because of wealth and because of this, uh, in his word, woman and gold. This lust and wealth. These are the two things which keeps a man attached. So what? I have to get rid of wealth. So but he was a pujari of Dakshineshwar. And naturally he used to get a small remuneration for his work. But he doesn't want money. So see that he has taken the resolution not to touch wealth. Now how is integrating it with his body? It's not a mere intellectual resolution that I don't want money. The moment he gets that money, he mixes it with a clot of clod of earth and says that the money is just as useless as this clod of earth. In Bengali used to say taka mati mati taka and will throw that lump along with that money in the water of the Ganges. So what the resolution is now getting synergized with the body, with an act. That he, in a spiritual practice, he found that that the distinct the, I, I, awareness of distinctions that I am great, someone is small, I am of higher, uh, what do you say this, uh, I belong to a very noble family and such and such persons belong to a very, uh, uh, what do you say, low esteemed uh, family background. So these all distinctions has to go. If God himself has become the universe, I have to see God in everyone. And that should give me that sense of unity. I can take a resolution. I can go on saying. But unless it reflects in my act, I can never, I will know that resolution, that type of thought is of no avail. Our scriptures were speaking of that the Salvam Khalvidam Brahma, that everything is Brahman. And the most horrible, this untouchability, caste distinctions were there for thousands of years. Why? The resolution has nothing to do with our acts. In the life of Sri Ramakrishna, we have a wonderful thing. Once he took the resolution that I have to look upon everyone as the manifestation of the divine, what doesn't allow me to do that? My ego. So I have to, uh, what you say, that trample over that ego. How? Say, so, he used to visit the, uh, the house of a sweeper in the dead of night. When Sri Ramakrishna was doing his spiritual practices, he had long years. He will go to the house of the sweeper in the dead of night when the sweeper was sleeping. And he will go to his toilet to cleanse that toilet with his ears. So it is all sometimes we find is totally unconventional. But we find that if you are sincere, if you really want to get rid then this, of the desires, then the resolution has to be synergistic. The body and the mind has to synergize. Then only all the worldly desires, which has so nicely synergistically has become a whole, body, mind, everything working together, then only you can counteract. So it has to come down to the physical level. So these are the two things. That resolution has to come down to the physical level. That morning I have to wake up, such and such time, I have to do my practices. This all speaks of bringing the resolution down to practice and at the same time, try gradually try to develop that emotion. First, with my resolution I have to practice and then the emotion factor will come gradually. It has to come because of the neuroplasticity of the mind. The thing which you go on to repeatedly you develop a love for it. It has to, once you create a groove in your mind, you develop a love for it. So that emotion grows. So these are the two factors which has to be brought into life if we really have to give up. Otherwise it's not easy. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying, that though he takes the resolution, at last we find that he 
in no way can get rid of it. So the worldly man is like a snake trying to swallow a mole. The snake can neither swallow the mole nor give it up. The bound soul may have realized that there is no substance to the world, that the world is like a hawk plum, only stone and skin, but still he cannot uh, give up, give it up and turn his mind to God. I once met a relative of Keshav Shem, 50 years old. He was playing cards as if the time has not yet come for him to think of God. There is another characteristic of the bound soul. If you remove him from his worldly surroundings to a spiritual environment, he will pine away. The worm that grows in filth feels very happy there. It thrives in filth. It will die if you put it in a pot of rice. <laughs> so Sri Ramakrishna in some other context uh, used to uh, narrate a very nice parable, a story, that a fisher of the story of the fisher woman. A fisher woman, uh, after uh, selling his, her fishes in the market, was returning to her village. And then there was a thunderstorm and she got stuck up. Uh, she couldn't return. So she took shelter in one of her friend's house, which was on the midway. And that the friend was actually uh, a gardener and she had a beautiful garden. And now the guard, this friend requested, why not stay the night here today? As the weather is not good, you, tomorrow morning you can return. So at night, somehow this fisherwoman found that she is not getting sleep. And then she realized the reason why she is not getting sleep. The beautiful flowers, the fragrance of the flowers, that's not in any way helping her to go to sleep because she is not habituated with that. She is a fisherwoman. She always gets the smell of the that, that stinky smell of the fish, the fishy, the, of the fish. So now what to do? Now she has already sold the fish, but you know that while before selling the fish, she scaled the fish. All the scales were removed, so all the scales were still there uh, with her in her fish basket. So she sprinkled some water over those scales, kept it just near her head. And when the, with the, with the wind, when the smell was of the coming of the, all those the scales of the fish, and now she started snoring. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna in some other context relates. That we, if a bound soul, even if he's kept in some very good environment, we will find that he or she is getting, uh, is feeling suffocated. In that Sri Ramakrishna relates that sometimes the devotees used to come with some of the relative or friend to Dakshineshwar. They used to come and when the devotee is listening to Sri Ramakrishna's conversation, sitting in his room, now this friend or the relative who is not that uh, spiritual oriented, the worldly person, he feels very much uh, disgusted. He is bored with all the discussions going on. So again, again and again he will go on just uh, nodding, uh, just uh, poking at the devotee and saying, when shall we get up? And when the devotee says, please wait a little, let me listen, because after all, he's a devotee, he is enjoying the talk, just wait a little, let me be, he be here for some more time. And at, at last this person gets becomes so much restless, he gets up and he will be just loitering outside, maybe in the garden, or he will go and sit in the boat. He will say that person, I'm going and sitting in the boat, and I will wait for you in the boat. So when it's over for you, please come. So he even doesn't feel or she doesn't feel to sit there even for a while. The devotee is enjoying the talk. For the other person, it's just a terrible punishment to be there for some time. So it is a samskar. It is our latent impressions. So we should all we should never we should always know that our samskaras has gravitated us to the environment in which we are. Sometimes we are frustrated uh, with our so-called surroundings. We think that if we can get rid of this, if we get some better environment, it will be spiritually fav uh, favorable for me. But most of the time we forget that it is our samskaras which gravitates us to the circumstances 
in which we find ourselves in our life. And you cannot simply change the circumstances by your willful choice. Even if you change, within a few days you will find that you were not for that environment. Our condition, as in the Aesop's fable has been spoken of, is like a fox. It has accidentally fall off, has fallen on some dye, the blue dye. And the entire uh, forest, all the animals thought it's a new animal. It must be some aristocratic animal. And they made him, declared him to be the king of the forest. And now this fox, he thought I have to hide my real identity. Otherwise, you know, this uh, in a few days, in just the moment they realize my real identity, they will simply drag me, uh, they will kill me and drag me down from the position they have uh, given me, this respect they have given me. So I have to be very quiet. I shouldn't be found out. But in two, three days, what happens? He cannot resist anymore because it has the habit of that howling. It starts howling, the fox, the howls, and all the other fox, that's the nature of the fox, they immediately respond to it by howling. All the fox will start howling in the same manner. And that's what happens. And all the animals realize, who is it? So even if we try to change our circumstances and be an environment, we think, oh, whatever I have done, now I will lead a good life. I know it for certain, it's not easy. Our, our desires gravitates us to the circumstances in which we are. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating, that even if we force ourselves to the spiritual environment, unless we are up to it, it is not going to help us. So there is another characteristic of the bound soul. If you remove him from his worldly surroundings to a spiritual environment, he will pine away. The worm that grows in filth feels very happy there. It thrives in filth. It will die if you put it on a pot of rice. It cannot even sustain itself, survive there. Uh, all remain silent. Vijay, what must the bound soul's condition of mind be in order to achieve liberation? So now, Sri Ramakrishna was speaking of the state of a bound soul. But What's the use of knowing that unless we know the way out? And that's what Vijay is asking. What must the bound soul's condition of mind be in order to achieve liberation? Master, he can free himself from attachment to woman and gold if by grace of God he cultivates a spirit of strong renunciation. What is this strong renunciation? One who has only a mild spirit of renunciation says, well, all will happen in the course of time. Let me now simply repeat the name of God. But a man possessed of a strong spirit of renunciation feels restless for God as the mother feels for her own child. A man of strong renunciation seeks nothing but God. He regards the world as a deep well and feels as if he were going to be drowned in it. He looks on his relatives as venomous snake, he wants to fly away from them, and he does go away. He never thinks, let me first make some arrangement for my family, and then I shall think of God. He has great inward resolution. So this is the thing which Sri Ramakrishna is saying. That what he's saying, that those who have that mild renunciation, not strong, mild spirit of he says, Will all will happen in the course of time? Let me now simply repeat the name of God. What it speaks of, he as if has decided to cross the river by keeping his one feet, his two feet in two different boats. Can a person really, really uh, what you say, cross the river by keeping his two fits in two different boats, impossible. He is bound to fall. It's not possible. So either if you have really thought of leading a spiritual life, it has to be a 24 by 7 spiritual life. There cannot be a part-time affair. That okay, let me take the name of God and then again I uh, get involved in my worldly ways. Let this both go on together as many of us think. So that way, it's not that it's uh, 
something which is a crime or a heinous uh, something which is very sinful it's okay but it is not going to give us the real spiritual illumination we were simply going on with the life with no as such remarkable change that the resolution has to be very strong it has to become feel restless for god as the mother feels for her own child so that's the thing we were just discussing few few days that you should have an overwhelming emotion to counteract this so called world this worldly uh, emotion this devotion this love for god it has to be overwhelming this is just the way a mother feels for the child a man of strong renunciation seeks nothing but god so as has been mentioned in the bible that god says that i am the jealous god even in narada bhakti sutra this it it is indicated that when uh, you say i love god god will be just seeing whether that love is divided or not if you find why is why say the god is a jealous god the interpretation is that when you love someone and you find that he or she loves someone else the way you feel jealous the jealousy grows so god also is the same way jealous when you say i love god god makes it sure you love god and god alone if he finds that it is it is actually being dissipated it is being uh uh what is it divided into many other so uh, objects of love then god is never going to respond to our love it has to be one pointed ekantina it is ekarati these are the words in sanskrit they say that it has to be one pointed even buddha used to say that what the spiritual journey is it is just like a rhinoceros when it runs it will run straight if you are being chased by a rhinoceros what's the way you can save yourself just uh, move sideways just don't because if you run straight to avoid the rhinoceros it will very quickly overrun you it will just it it, it has tremendous speed that way you can never get uh, rid of the rhinoceros it is going to chase you down what's the way just move sideways it will move straight buddha is saying that your your go you that your uh, approach to the goal should just the way of it, the way the rhinoceros chases its goal its destination so if you have any other diversions no for certain it's not going to lead you to that spiritual goal so you cannot have uh, this attain liberation so he seeks nothing but god he regards the world as a deep well and feels as if he were going to be drowned in it so that's the thing which has been spoken of he looks on his relatives as that what's the worldly pleasure like there's a nice story parable again that a man was chased by a tiger and then at last the man was running and he never knew that there is a well because it was covered with bushes so he somehow slipped into it he was falling and then somehow he managed to get hold of a creeper so he didn't fall so he thought i am saved but how long can he hold on to the creeper and hang so he looked down and he saw a snake with its hood up inside that hole if he falls he is going to be bitten by the snake on the top there is the lion and then in this condition at any moment that he, he cannot climb up now he can fall he sa- he sees a ripe fruit which is be- be- which is within his reach so he plucks that fruit and is eating so that's what is the pleasure of life death is there waiting for us all in from all the sides and in that so if somehow we for the time being such is the maya we forget and we get uh, satisfied involved in what the immediate sense of pleasure is just near us forgetting that it is of no avail the death is waiting for him so that's the thing we find that that's the parable that is reminded uh, be remind I, it made me remind that parable when i just 
heard this word. He regards the world as a deep well. And it's just like that man and feels as if he's going to be drowned in it. He looks on his relatives as venomous snakes. He wants to fly away from them. And he does go away. He never thinks, let me first make some arrangement for my family and then I shall think of God. He has great inward resolution. Even in the Yoga Sutra, we have read that there is a Sutra. What is the Sutra? Tibra Sangveganam Asana. That when shall I reach the goal? That you have spoken of all the ways, the eightfold paths, the eight practices. Yama, Niyama, Asara, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. Now, following the steps, when shall I reach the goal? Is there any time, uh, fixed time? Like all, uh, in our academic courses, there are four years course, five years course, or two years, whatever it may be. Is there any some fixed time that I will get the certificate, I will achieve the goal? So here the Yoga Sutra is saying, Tivra Sangveganam Asana. There is no fixed time. It depends on how much is your intense desire for reaching the goal. The one who has that intensity, the tremendous yearning, for him it is asana. It is just near, waiting for him. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that the yearning is just like the red hue of the dawn sky. In the dawn, in the dawn when the sun is yet to rise, you are not, you cannot, you are yet to see the sun. But the red hue you see in the sky, and you know. That in no time, just as a matter of few minutes, the sun will be visible. So Sri Ramakrishna is saying that yearning is just like that red hue of the dawns. It is very, it is near, waiting for you. So if you have that strong resolu uh, that resolution, the tremendous yearning to reach the goal, and what that tremendous yearning is, Sri Ramakrishna speaks in some other context. What is like? A disciple says to the Guru that I do have intense yearning. But why? Nothing is happening to me. And the Guru take, took the disciple to the nearby pond to have a dip there. And when the disciple took a dip, the Guru was just wetting. He, he thirsted his head inside the water, not allowing him to get up. And he was panting for breath. And then when he was almost about to collapse, the Guru released him. He got up. And took a deep breath and now the Guru asked that how were you feeling? Well I was just panting for breath, I was suffocating, I was panting for breath. Do you feel for God that way? Do you feel the world to be like that? Uh, uh, as if you are immersed in the water, the same way do you feel that the world is something in which you are immersed and you want to breathe, you just want to get out of it? Do you feel that way? Is it that intense? So just to experience that intensity, just to explain that intensity, Guru took him to that pond and forcefully thirsted him. So that speaks that do you really feel that you are getting drowned by this world? You really want God to rest like that fresh air? So then, know for certain, it is just near at hand, waiting for you. Tibra Sangvegana Asana. So, so that's what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating, that it is possible if you have that tremendous renunciation, the tremendous yearning. And then he speaks of, uh, this gives an example of the two farmers, the parable of the two farmers. I will just read out because it doesn't, uh, it is self-explanatory. That what we just discussed, it explains that. That we'll read out and then conclude our class today. So let me tell you a story, Sri Ramakrishna is saying, about strong renunciation at one time there was a drought in certain part of the country. The farmers began to cut long channels to bring water to the fields. One farmer was stubbornly determined. He took a vow that he would not stop digging until the channel connected his field with the river. He set to work. The time came for his bath and his wife sent their daughter to him with oil. Father, said the girl, it is already let. Rub your body with oil and take your bath. Go away, thundered the farmer. I have too much to do now. It was past midday 
and the farmer was still at work in his field. He didn't even think of his bath. Then his wife came and said, Why haven't you taken your bath? The food is getting cold. You overdo everything. You can finish the rest tomorrow or even today after dinner. The farmer scolded her furiously and ran at her, spade in hand, crying, What? Have you no sense? There's no rain. The crops are dying. What will the children eat? You will all starve to death. I have taken a vow not to think of bath and food today before I bring water to my field. The wife saw his state of mind and ran away in fear. Through a whole day's backbreaking labor, the farmer managed by the evening to connect his field with the river. Then he sat down and watched the water flowing into his field with a murmuring sound. His mind was filled with peace and joy. He went home, called his wife and said to her, Now give me some oil and prepare me a smoke. With serene mind he finished his bath and meal and retired to bed with uh, where he snowed to his heart's content. The determination he showed is an example of strong renunciation. Now there was another farmer who was also digging a channel to bring water to his field. His wife too came to the field and said to him, It's very late. Come home. It isn't necessary to overdo things. The farmer didn't protest much, but put aside his spade and said to his wife, Well, I will go home since you ask me to, or love. That man never succeeded in irrigating his field. This is a case of mild renunciation. As without strong determination, the farmer cannot bring water to his field, so also without intense yearning, a man cannot realize God. To Vijay, why don't you come here now as frequent as before? So that's a wonderful story, the parable with which Sri Ramakrishna explains that, that how much that strong yearning, resolution is required to achieve your goal. And we will take up from this story uh, again in the next class to discuss uh, the various aspects which has been actually uh, disc, uh, indicated by Sri Ramakrishna in this story. And then we will continue with the discussion of Sri Ramakrishna with Vijay Goswami. So to with this, we conclude our discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskars.